Father Frontier is a survival city building game, one of the best releases for sure of 2022. It actually started in early access in August 22, wasn't fully fully ready at that point but already a great game, but since then got some really strong updates, pretty much fixed all of the bugs, had a lot of quality of life improvements and even new functionalities. The game is already ready to play today, you don't have to wait for the full release. And if you don't believe me or all of the great reviews on Steam, don't hesitate to also watch my full let's play where I show in the hardest difficulty how to strive from start to finish. Gameplay wise again this is a survival city building, think about Banished or more recently Settlement Survival, mixed with some very classical city building aspect from Anno and other games like this and also a strong RTS side. It may actually seem daunting at first but don't worry if you follow these 10 tips I'm going to share with you all you will definitely survive, thrive and even build an amazing city in Father Frontier. This is a game set as you can see in the late medieval period. There is no clear geographical or exact historical setting but personally it makes me think a lot of the time of the colonization of the US with pioneers you know that are creating new town from scratch fighting both the rough terrain, attack from bandits and natives and many things like this. Before we dive into the tips one element I wanted to share is that there is no tutorial per se in the game but there is actually an online Wikipedia where you can see a lot of different elements for example if I click on happiness over here right they're going to describe a lot of the things like the different needs that you have so you can also get some good introduction there and on top of that there's also a lot of information in game in many of the buildings when you click on this question mark it will add overlays that explain what to do it explains for example that if i click on this button here it will remove all of the selected crops and of course feel free to also ask me questions in the comments below if you have i'll do my best to answer okay let's dive in with tip number one and this is even before you start the game anytime you create a new settlement a new game you will see a lot of options you can see some options over here but even more if you click over here on advanced settings and this is really my tip number one is don't hesitate to tweak a bit the settings on one side for your first let's play for example don't hesitate to go for pioneer the easy difficulty also don't hesitate to click over here on the pacifist mode and therefore in this first playthrough it will be easy for you to just understand all the game mechanics understand you know, the industries get familiar with the game and then when you restart a second time then you can play with raiders similarly for your first let's play I would suggest that you just go with idyllic valley which is a sort of flat valley with a lot of resources so once again really good for your first let's play just to understand the game but this is not just for your first let's play even after that i think what's really good over here and tip number one is you know don't hesitate to tweak your settings right maybe what you want to do is for example get attacked a lot but you want to start with a lot of resources just to get started very quickly so after you've tweaked the settings to be aligned a bit to your favorite gameplay and to what you want to do, you're starting. And as soon as you start, you need to choose your starting location. It may seem like an easy choice, but it's actually not and it's quite an important one. First of all, you want something that's fairly flat. If it's on the side of the mountain, you won't even be able to build it. But at the top of the mountain or just next to the mountain is also not such a great idea. Yes, it is true that having a height advantage will help you against Raider. And also it is true that you can flatten the terrain but you don't want to have to deal with this at the beginning of the game so choose somewhere that's fairly flat then you will want to be able to gather food quite quickly resources like the hathorn you can see here the greens as well as deers that we can see over here all of these resources are quite important but don't put your town just on the resources put them next to it right because if you put your town on it you're going to destroy them. Do note also that if you press S4, you will be able to see exactly how much resources there is. So for example, here there's only two deers. Here there's 20 greens. And this is even more important for resources like clay or coal. Right, you can see that here it's 2000, so it's quite good. Some others will be just 200 clay and that will be a lot different. And that leads me to the next element is after the food, you will also want some resources to build. You will want some trees, you will want some clay, you will also want some stones like this and later on you will even want things like iron, sand, gold and coal. For example over here I can see some iron and here some coal. But to be honest you don't need to be right next door to those resources. You will need them at some point but not right away. What you will need quite soon is the clay. 
so do make sure that the clay is not too far from your starting location. Then if you press F, you will be able to see the overlay for the fertility. Fertility is quite important for your farm later on, but once again, you don't want to actually put your town where it's super fertile because then you're wasting that space. You actually want to put your town where it's a bit less fertile, but not too far from the fertile line so that when you expand into farms, then you'll be able to build them. Then if you press I, you will see the water overlay. This will show you where there is a lot of water in the ground. So here, for example, there are less. Here, there's a bit more. And here, obviously, there's a lake. So there's a lot more water. The mountain is quite bare in terms of water. You definitely don't want to build your town there. That will be bad. You do need water for your population. They need to drink. You need water for many production. So once again, somewhere over here is not too bad. And then the last element I wanted to tell you around your starting location is try to put the exact location on your tunnel where there's not a lot of trees. For example, here, there's no trees at all to build it. If I want to build over here, I need to cut you know, those four trees. I need to take out this stone. The reason why it's bad is because you can't build anything until your town hall is built. And if I have to you know, cut all of those trees, take out all of those stones before I can build the town hall, this will slow me down. So again, tip number two, do think a bit about your starting location. Try to find somewhere that's a bit flat, close to a lot of resources, but not on the resources themselves. And if it took you a long time to find this perfect location and now you want to restart once again you know you can press escape and find the exact seed over here tip number three let's talk about our people what do they need well to be honest they are not so complex of course if you get to tier three large houses or tier four minor house they're gonna want a lot of things for example this large house over here right they're consuming a number of different resources different foods but also pottery soap water and to get them to the manor house i need even more right i need to give them furniture and to give them glasswares and if i want to get my whole population to 100 percent happiness of course this is a bit complex but you won't lose your people if they are not 100 percent happy or if they're living in shelters instead of manor houses they're not gonna leave your village so at the beginning let's focus on the minimum what do you need to get your people so that they don't die and don't leave but basically you need to give them food and this is why you can see at the top this is the most important resources so food is your number one priority and this is why in the buildings you have a whole section of food buildings right because there's many ways to get food and we're going to talk about which one is good priority number two is you want to make sure they have access to water with a basic well and they have access to firewood with a firewood splitter in particular for winter basically with this water and firewood you will avoid them dying of sickness too soon, in particular in winter once again. Tip number four, you will always need a lot of laborers and a lot of builders. Even if you're not building new buildings, you will need to maintain your buildings and you will always need laborers to gather wood and stone, for example. The great thing is that the game will help you. If you press P, you will get into this menu where you can see your whole population, where they're working, I, for example, have four people working in the brick maker. I have 44 people working as farmers where I could have 46. So we could put more like this. Then I can see that I have currently 113 laborers. This is really a lot. This is great. I have three people working as builders. So either they're building something or maybe they're repairing right now. And I've put a limit to have 20, right? I could have 20 builders if needed. I could increase that or I could decrease that. Once again, the game helps you there because if you don't have enough laborer for your size of your city, this will become red with a big warning side. If this is the case, make sure that you increase your population, maybe decrease how many farmers you have or how many soldiers you have. On the other side, for the builders, they don't really help you there. So you need to keep that in mind. At the beginning, you usually have around five and that's fine for, you know, the first few minutes. But then when your city grows, you need to make sure to increase that number by to follow the growth of your city. In particular, when you start making walls or when you need to rebuild your town after an attack, you want to make sure that you have a lot of builders in your city or a lot of people that could become builders. Tip number five. Now that we know what are the priorities in food, water, firewood, let me show you what are the first building you really want to do and the ones you don't want to do. Of course, the exact number of building, the positioning will depend on your map, on your difficulty. But whatever your difficulty level, these next few buildings are definitely the one you want to do. As I said previously, the first thing you're going to have to do is to clear the space of the town hall and to build a town hall. 
And to build your tunnel, you need 16 logs, right? So we're going to harvest. Harvest is with H. And pressing H, you can see that you can even choose what you should harvest. And you can see that you can even choose what your laborers are going to harvest. Is it only the trees? Is it everything? In this case over here, we're going to focus first on trees. This is really what's important. Anything else, you know, it's not so important right now. So here it is. This way, as you can see now, they're moving, they're going there because everybody is a laborer right now, they're all going. That's the first thing you really want to do. And by the way, this is something that you also have to do regularly. It's not just at the beginning of the game, you will always want to cut some trees. The logs are used everywhere, right? For firewood, for planks, and then many things later. I hadn't planned to cover this in the tutorial, but I'm not being attacked by a predator over here. If that happens to you, you know, at the beginning of the game, you don't have soldiers, but all you can do is just, you select all of your people and you make sure to attack the predator so that you know very quickly they kill it before that uh, predator oh no it's wolves actually before they attack you now that our town hall is built we can really get cracking if you press b you will see all of your buildings by categories amenities and services housing storage etc it's not because something is unlocked that you need to do it for example here you have the graveyard don't start there so where should you start we are right now in the early summer right we see that we have nine months of food. We have 12 people, but it's red because um, nobody has houses, right? So they are living outside. And of course, after summer, we're gonna get into autumn and then into winter. So what we need to do is two things. One is we need to make sure that we have firewood for winter. And two, we need to try to have enough food to survive this winter too, right? Because in winter, basically you can't do much. So to do that, first of all, let's go into the resource. And in resource, you know, you have the water, but we're not going to start there. We're first going to do the firewood splitter. This will impact your desirability, the attractiveness of your population, of your city negatively. So we're not going to put it close to the houses. I'm going to talk about that later, but let's put it for now close to our town. As you can see, I haven't put roads yet. We're going to talk about that also later. So they're going to do this first one, the firewood splitter. This is really your priority number one. Then in my opinion, priority number two should be houses, should be shelters. Because if you don't have shelters for the winter, you're really in trouble. As I said though, you don't want to put it close to a firewood splitter. We're going to put it on the other side. To start, four, like this. Small block of four. So that's the second thing you want to do. The third thing we want to do is food. We want to try to get some food in, right? We have quite a few that are open. We have the hunter cabin to hunt for food. We have the forager shack to forage, you know, for berries and things like this. Then the fishing shack, which is to, to fish in the lake. Then the crop field for farms. And lastly, the smokehouse. I have seen people say you should build first the smokehouse. I completely disagree. Why? Because if you look at your food over here, we have no meat and no fish that is not smoked right now. So before building a smokehouse, we should actually get some meat or some fish. If you build very close to a lake, maybe you want to go for the fish. If not, then you probably want to go for a hunter cabin. For a hunter cabin, we see that over here we have some deers, so that's great. Let's put it once again quite close to a city. You know, there's not a perfect choice between a hunter cabin or a forager shack or a fishing shack. You know, as quickly as possible, you're going to want multiple of each so that you have different types of food. But for now, you know, just build one to get you started. That's already quite a lot of wood, right? Because each of these houses was 10 wood. This hunter cabin is also 10 wood and the firewood splitter was 8 wood, right? So you're already talking about quite a bit of wood. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the speed. Let's speed that up a bit so I can show you the next step. But really, these are the first rebuilding you have to do. Each building will have three stages. The first stage is to clear the ground where you want to place the building. If there's a tree, they're going to cut it. If there's stone, they're going to take it out, those type of thing. Second stage is delivering the resources that are needed. For example, in this case, you know, we need 10 logs. They've already delivered nine, so there's one missing. And in the fourth stage, after you've delivered, you'll see a number. For example, here it starts at 20, now it's 18. You can think of this as a bit of a countdown of somebody needs to actually build it, right? So there is somebody there, you know, it's a builder and this is going down. The building is actually, you know, slowly but surely being built, which is amazing. And here it is, it is done. Before we move into the next building that are important, for the hunter cabin and similar buildings like this, you will have a work area. This is, this is the radius that you see in yellow. And to move it, you know, you click on this button here. 
this is very important to move it to where there's actually you know what you want so for example in this case we want to move it where the deers are right so you can look at where the deer, deers are they're all the way here so this is what we're going to do in the case of berries you know we would move to where the berries are those type of things we're still in the summer so we have a bit of time and we have a bit of log so how are we going to spend our logs the fourth building i really suggest you build is the basic well for two reasons the first one is that by giving water to your people, you know, you give them something to drink, something to wash with, so their hygiene is going up, so they are going to be less sick. The second reason is that if you don't have a well and you get a fire, then you're in trouble. If you have a well, your villagers are automatically going to the well, take some water and put out the fire. So this is the fourth building, a well. And number five is indeed the smokehouse. You don't want to build it before you have an hunter cabin or a fishing shack, but now that we have one, let's make sure to build it. This way any meat or fish that you get will get smoked and therefore it will take a lot more time to spoil. Do not that both for the well, you need five stone and for the smokehouse, you need eight. So you're gonna need to collect a bit of stone, right? So far, if you press H, so far we told them to only get trees. Now it's basically a bit the time where you want to make sure they also get a bit of stone. Now that you have both the well and the smokehouse, you're sort of in a good space for winter. It's not perfect space yet, but it's a good space. All of our people are inside the house. We've started to make some firewood. We have 50 right now, for example, and we've started to gather a bit of food. So what do you need next? Well, you need to do two things. The first one is we only have five months of food, so that definitely doesn't seem enough. And to be honest, you're gonna need to do that the whole game. Every year, continue to increase your food production. Why it will never stop? Because the second thing is, you need to put more houses. You know, you need to get more people into your town, more workers. You need to have some space for immigrants. You need to have some space for new child. I said earlier, you shouldn't build a graveyard. Well, the reality is you shouldn't build it until somebody dies. And right now we do have somebody that is deceased, it's because of the uh, wolves, they kill someone. So when you do have somebody that's killed, then you should build a graveyard. You know, the graveyard, whatever the size, is always the same cost in terms of resources, five stone, but the bigger you make it, the longer it's gonna take to work. So we're not gonna make a big one, we can always make a second one later. Okay, so we have the first forager shack that's built. So, you know, you can move around and at the bottom over here, you'll see what are the resources that are inside the radius. And you try obviously to maximize it to get, you know, a couple of different resources, but all at the same time, also not too far away, right? And we're already at the beginning of winter, by the way, you can see it's snowing. So we're not going to be able to gather a lot more, but we have seven months of food. So we should be fine now for um, winter. The last thing I wanted to share with you is you need to do everything in a sustainable way. Sustainable hunting, sustainable gathering. So for example, you know, you can definitely build five hunter cabins, but don't put five hunter cabins to work on those five deers or six deers. If you do that, they will, all six will be killed in like three months and then they will never come back. Versus if you put just one hunter, two hunter, if it's a big, you know, number of animals, and they're going to kill, let's say, half of it during the year. And then because you only killed half, they're going to still make babies and, you know, continue to grow. And then you just put your other hunter cabins on other deers somewhere else in the map. Yes. Also, if you're still here, hopefully you're liking this video. So smash the like button. You know, we are tip five out of the 10 that I said, but actually after the 10 basic tips that I'm sharing now, I'm also going to share with you five advanced tips. So don't leave right away. But let's move to tip number six. As you saw, I didn't build any road right now at the beginning. It is because roads are not necessary. Your people can walk everywhere. You know, later on, we're gonna build wagons and things like this. This can even go anywhere without roads. So roads are not mandatory like in Anno or in Caesar 4, but they do help your people move faster. So it's not like they're useless. Now to make roads, you press N and you're basically going to drag from a starting point to an end point. Your roads don't have to be straight. As you can see, you know, I can do diagonal, I can do strange shapes as you want. If you do want to make sure that something is straight, just press the shift button. If you press the shift button, it will ensure that it is straight. As you can see, it costs no resources, but it costs some uh, work time for your people to do it. 
in this stage this is when it's not being worked yet if you've made the road at the wrong place also remember you can click over here to uh, cancel it but they are not necessary but they can definitely be useful allowing your villagers to travel faster but also sometimes to help organize your city in particular i do like a bit the grid system in many of the game so you can see over here the city right we have the market in the middle and then we have roads to help a bit organize this or over here right you have all of my fields there's not roads everywhere, but there's a road in the middle. So while you shouldn't build roads right away, I do suggest that at some point you start building some, especially if you have people doing nothing. You can even upgrade the roads, right? From the roads, if you click over here to upgrade, it will cost a bit of stone, but it will make them even faster and also look a bit prettier. So for example, in this town over here, I have sort of main street. The last important element around roads is that most buildings will have an entry exit point. You can see this green arrow where the door of the house is. This is where people will, you know, enter and exit the building, right? Either to deliver resources, to go sleep or to take out the resources. So you want to make sure that this arrow actually goes to a street. You're putting a street to make them travel faster, but if the exit or entrance is not on the street, they have to go all the way around. So that was tip number six. Roads are not mandatory, but they do get useful, especially the bigger your town is. Tip number seven. If you press R, you will see all of your resources. And when you click on a specific resource, you will see a number of details, how much you've produced last year, those type of things. Also, usually where it's produced and what it's used. But more importantly, you are able to set quotas. And in particular, a maximum quota that can be really useful for certain resources. For example, for arrows. It's great to have arrows, but you don't really need 5,000 arrows. A small town, maybe you need 100. A big town like I have here, you know, I've put a quota of 600. And what's really interesting with that functionality is that when you reach the quota, so let's say, for example, when I reach 700 firewood, all of the people that were making firewood, they're going to stop working, but they're not going to just sit around and do nothing. They're going to become laborers and constructors. So this is really good to not have to micromanage too much some of your productions. So again, tip number seven, make sure that you use the production limits. Tip number eight, there are a number of statistic menus that will make your life a lot easier. I already told you that by pressing R, you get into this resource menu where you can see at one glance all of the resources that you have in your city. All right, so that's really, really great. I can see, okay, I'm really low on sand right now but I have a lot of grain, those type of things. So this is already a first level. If you don't know what's happening in your city, you can start there. I also already told you earlier about the profession menu, shortcut P, where you can see all of your people. For example, I can see that I'm missing two farmers over here, so let's add two. I'm also missing somebody in the smokehouse. There is one hunter that is sick, so what you may want to do is take out that person and put a new person in. So now I have one laborer that's sick, but it won't impact as much my productions, right? Then next one, if you click over here, you can see the detail on your happiness. The happiness is going to impact a lot of things, including your work rate. If your people are happy, they're going to work more. I said at the beginning, you don't need a 100% happiness, but of course, if you do get a 100% happiness, then you know you do get bonuses. Of course, that's great. What's really good about this one is you can see where the problems are. I can see, for example, that all of my people have enough food, but only 69% of my people have shoes. So it will give you really at a glance where do you need to focus next if you want to increase your happiness. Last but not least, actually almost the most important and the one that many people don't know about is over here. Right in the top left corner, you have this button over here where you can see food production, good and material productions, and villager information. First one on food production, you can see all types of food, protein, grains, vegetable, fruits, and dairy. If you click on it, you can also see the different types inside. For example, for vegetables, you have the greens, the mushrooms, the beans, the root vegetables, and the preserved vegetables, right? And for each of these, you will see how many you've produced in the last year, how many you've consumed, and how much was spoiled. You want to make sure that your consumption is below your production. If your consumption is above your production, you're gonna have a big problem, right? And you can also see spoilage. Where am I getting a lot of spoilage? And similarly for your production goods, right? For example, in armaments, I can see, okay, last year I consumed 87 arrows, I only produced 54. So I have a problem. I need to have more Fletcher to make more arrows. So these reports are really important to optimize your city, to see where there are problems. I do suggest, you know, every year or every two years, you look at it and you see what's happening. That was team number eight. Make sure you use the status menu at the top of the year and also the ones that you get 
pressing R and P. Tip number 9, let's talk about layout. The first thing I want to say about layout is don't overthink it too much. Why? Because you can move every single building in the game for free. If you click over here, relocate building location, you know, I can put it anywhere I want for free. It won't cost me any resources. The only resource that it will cost is time. You know, there's a builder that needs to go there, deconstruct it and reconstruct it. You may remember I already mentioned at the beginning of the video that there are some buildings that will impact negatively your attractiveness. In particular, most of the resource production and desirability is important because you need your houses to be desirable for people to want to stay there and also to upgrade. That is the first aspect of layouts and why you need layouts. The second reason why you need layouts is that this is not like Anno 1800 where you have a central theoretical storage, meaning every time there is a resource that goes into a warehouse, it's available anywhere on your island. In Father Frontier, if I use this iron mine over here to mine some iron and deliver it into the stockyard that's over here, my workers here, they're actually living somewhere, right? So they're going to eat and sleep in the village over here. Then they're going to walk all the way to the mine. Then from the mine, they're going to do their thing. Right? They're going to mine iron. Then they're going to walk to the stockyard and deliver over in the stockyard. Then this iron may be used in the foundry, right? What will happen for the foundry is that somebody is going to pick up in the stockyard, walk back to the foundry and deliver you know, this iron. So there's actual delivery, there's actual pickup of resources. It takes time. You can actually even see it for each building at the bottom over here. How much time your people are actually working. In this case over here, only 33% of the time these guys are working. So this is the second reason why you want to have layout. You're going to want to put the industries that are using the same materials close to each other to limit traveling times and also put storages in strategic places so that people don't have to walk too far also to deliver or to pick up resources. You need to think of your city as three big neighborhoods. The first big neighborhood is your city. You know, this is where you're going to have your uh, amenities and services like your market and your hospital and all of your houses. This is where you want a high attractiveness. You're going to also have decorations and things like this. Then you're going to want to put your heavy industry as far away as possible from that. So, you know, this is where I have all of my in heavy industries over here. I actually separated it into two because I have these ones very close to the mine and then these ones that don't really need the mine. These ones are more focused on, you know, the wood basically are more on this corner over here. And then your third neighborhood is going to be food production. And you can see that in the case of this town, I actually have several of those neighborhoods. I have one over here. I have one over here at the bottom. And then I have a lot of fields over here. And then I actually have even a small one that's just outside of my town over here. So it's three types of neighborhood. And that's how you need to think about it. But again, don't overthink it too much. You can move your buildings for sure without any problems. And then lastly, there is also, of course, online a lot of different layouts you know, none of them are perfect but i will put in the video description below if you want to see it in particular i think this one worked really well for a big city you have the theater in the middle and then four markets but this was tip number nine the layout of your city is again quite important but don't overthink it too much and remember tip number 10 is not the last one i have five bonus advanced tips for you just after but again, if you're still watching, please press the like button. It really does help. I spent a lot of time preparing this video, so I'd love to get some love. Tip number 10 is on food. Really start with your hunter cabin, your forager shack, your fishing shack. You know, these ones will give you food right away. The crop field, this will be your exponential growth. They will give you a lot more food, but they are going to take quite a bit of time. So let me give you some tips over here. The first one is what size should you go for? You see that there's a minimal size, you know, 5x4 is not enough, you need 5x5, five five, that's the minimum. So if you're really at the beginning, you're struggling, maybe just go by 5x5. Five five. But this is actually not perfect. Similar to the graveyard, the size doesn't impact the cost in terms of resource, as it's actually zero in any case, but it impacts a lot the cost in terms of time. 5x5 uh, five five will cost 1,100, so a lot more than you know houses that were 20. But if I increase it a lot more, you see this is 3000, for example, right? So you do need to be careful about this. Though I do not suggest to actually go for 5x5, five because five, if you see 5x5 five five here is two workers. If I go 5x6, this is still two workers. 
it's only when I get to 7x8 that I get to 3 workers. So what I suggest is, first of all, think a bit more about how many workers you have available and then go for the maximum link to that size. So if you only have 2 workers, you know, 7x7. Seven seven. Another one that's often suggested, for example, is 10x10. 10 10. But 10x10 10 10 is 5 people. If you look, 10x9 10 is only 4 people. And a lot of people were saying you need to do 10x10 10 10 because this is grazing areas of your cows of your bounds. This is actually not the case anymore. As you can see, this is way bigger than 10 by 10. Similar to other building, when you decide to uh, put a new field, they will start by clearing it, right? This is the first space over here. They're cutting trees and things like this. Then when this is done, they will start working. In this case, it needs 1,700. Gonna take a bit of time, but as you can see, I'm bringing a lot of different people to work on it, prioritize it. But this is also why at the beginning of the game, I really do not suggest to have put too many farms and focus first on the hunters and things like this, because as you can see, this is taking quite a lot of time, even with a lot of people. Now, unfortunately, when this is finished, hopefully she's going to finish soon, taking our sweet time, this is not the end. This field here was in a pretty good place in my city, but only has a fertility of 64%. On top of that, there is 85% of weeds and 13% of rocks. This will, of course, depend on where you put it on your map and many different things, right? So you may not see the same numbers. I'm going to get very little yield, you know, very little output for all of the energy that I put into it. So instead of that, what you need to do at the beginning is you need to clean this field, right? We need to optimize this field. To do that, you have two ways to do it. The first one is a faster one, but provides no food at all while you're doing it. The second one provides some food, but therefore will take a bit longer. The first one is the fast one. You will put for every single year two of these farmers that are working. You know, they're doing field maintenance, which means that they're going to basically cut the weeds, you know, reduce the weed level, and they're also going to remove rocks. And then after that, you will put some clover. Why? Because the clover is something that will increase your fertility. The second is slightly longer, but it will give you some food. It is to actually start with a bit of peas. They are not going to give you a perfect yield, but it's an easy food, a short food to give you some vegetables. And then for the rest of the year, they're working to take some, uh, some of the weeds and rocks and increase the fertility. The other reason to use the peas is because they will also slightly improve your fertility. Versus if you look at everything else, like here those wheat, this will decrease your fertility. I know that the fields are a bit complex, but at the same time, I feel like this is really one of the great things in this game. So don't hesitate if you have any questions in the comments below. And that was our 10 basic tips to survive, to thrive into Father Frontier. But let's dive into our 5 bonus tips, a bit more advanced tips. Before we do so though, do remember that we have a full Let's Play on the channel. See in the video description below if you want to see it. First bonus tip, let's talk about walls. Walls are very important to protect your city. And this is the first thing that is going to be attacked by the raiders. So when you get attacked, usually, you know, some of them will get destroyed. And sometimes it's hard to find them. It can be tedious to rebuild them one by one. But don't worry, there is a tip. You press X and then you can select, you know, as much walls as you want. And it will tell you many things like, do you want to salvage them? Do you want to rebuild everything that has been destroyed? And how much will that cost you? Do you want to upgrade it all and how much will that cost you? And you even want to prioritize when you're rebuilding or upgrading. But secondly, what I wanted to say about walls is don't hesitate to do what I've done a bit here, is to have intra walls, right? So for example, here I have a wall that's protecting this small thing. Then I have another wall that's protecting this, especially at the beginning. You know, at the beginning, it may be very hard to have a wall that's taking the whole map. But to have a small world that's protecting key infrastructures, for example, here, I have two mills. Those mills are using heavy tools. Heavy tools are super expensive, super hard to make at the beginning. So if these get destroyed, that can set you back a lot. So having a world that's protecting that, you know, and not everything else can be super useful. Advanced tip number two, let's talk about decorations. And in particular, the fact that some decorations stack while others don't. What does that mean? Well, if I look at this manner over here, I'm getting, for example, at the bottom, you know, 13% from the theater, 7% from the market square. But if you look at the top, you can see I'm also getting 11% from garden trail with a four in parentheses. Why? Because I actually have many garden trails. You know, these are this one over here, over there, and there's a fourth one somewhere, maybe this one that's in range and they stack, meaning, you know, each of these is giving me two, three percent but because I have four of them, I'm actually getting 
but many of the decorations actually do not stack. So for example, over here, I have a large park. If I go over here and I build another large park over here, you can see that the desirability of this house is actually not moving. It's not increasing, it stays at 93% because there's already a large park next to it. So it's not going to stack. Advanced tip number three, build a preservist building as soon as you can. Try to aim for it because this will help a lot with your food production. At, at the beginning, you can only smoke meat and fish and that will reduce the spoilage obviously for meat and fish but it doesn't impact at all your vegetable, all of the berries and fruits. You need a preservist to preserve those ones. To make it work, you're gonna need some glassware. Glassware is also a tier three building over here, which will require sand and coal and also some iron to build it. So I know it's not so easy, but I do suggest that you have it as a goal, you know, try to get there as soon as possible. Advanced tip number four is very important, especially if you played the game the beginning but you haven't played it in a while with the update 0.8 they've improved the balancing of the game a lot so now for example it doesn't make sense to produce the minimum of everything and then tons of cheese or tons of something like this that you know will sell well instead i suggest that you try to produce a bit more than what you need of everything and then you sell the surplus that you have of everything it will also help you because instead of having to wait for a specific merchant to arrive and want to buy your cheese. Now, every time a merchant comes, you can sell a bit of everything, right? So it's a lot better both for your economy, but also because they've balanced the game. So basically now cheese is not, you know, so overpowered and similarly for all the other resources. And then last advanced tip, but super important one is many buildings can be upgraded, but not all of them make sense or not all of them are worth it as soon as you can do it. Let me show you some examples of good upgrades and some bad upgrades. For example, one really good upgrade is your basic well. This will increase your capacity. This will increase how quickly it accumulates. This will also increase the desirability and the durability. So yes, of course, it does cost some resources. And I'm not saying that, you know, as soon as you have five iron, you need to spend it. But this cost is not huge and it does provide tons of bonus, especially in the middle of your turn. Another amazing example of a good upgrade that you should do as soon as you can, another sort of objective you should have is the market. With that, instead of one person working in the market, you're going to have two, which means that it's basically easier to get the resources in the market and to deliver to your people so everybody else can work longer. You also increase the desirability, but more importantly, two of other things is the radius increases. Right? This is the radius and all houses that are inside this radius will give me gold. Right? So increasing this radius is super important and on top of that it will provide additional income. It's basically doubling the income that you make from houses. So super important, you know, as soon as you can do this upgrade. On the other hand, there are a lot of other upgrades that may not be worth it. And when I say worth it, I don't mean that they're useless. They always provide something. But the question is, do you need to upgrade it or should you just build another one, for example? The hunter cabin, for example, you can upgrade it, it will cost you some iron, some gold and a bit of planks. What will it do? Well, the building will be a bit harder to destroy. That's not super important. It doesn't cost anything. And then upgrading it, you don't even get a second worker or anything like that. You just get access to two more recipes where you are able to create animal traps and also use, you know, small carcasses. So it's really not that huge. You know, it's maybe best to just build another hunter lunch if you feel you have a problem. There are many other tips and tricks I could share with you, but again, I suggest you just click on the full Let's Play that's appearing now on the screen if you want to hear more. And please don't hesitate to share in the comments if you have any thoughts, questions. Also, if you like to press the like button and I hope to see you next time.